Good morning. Recess over. President Obama addressing the nation's schools today as lawmakers return to Washington in the heated debate over health care reform. Is there anything the president can say or do in what's become a crucial speech tomorrow night to quiet his critics? We'll ask one of them, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Frightening scene, a motorized parachute crashes into a Labor Day crowd in Utah, injuring at least six people, including three children. And it was all caught on tape. And smash hit, Melanie Udan, the 17-year-old sensation from Georgia, burning up the courts and the competition at the U.S. Open. And her shoes say it all, believe. We'll meet her today, Tuesday, September 8, 2009. From NBC News, this is Today with Matt Lauer and Meredith Vieira, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And welcome to Today on this Tuesday morning. I'm Meredith Vieira. And I'm Matt Lauer. And it's been three weeks since three, I've seen I know. You. I feel like it's the first day back at school, don't you, a little bit? No. No. <laughs> Why do I have like a school outfit on? I did my summer reading. You got book. your book covers. Rob Look Lagoyevich, at you. Rob Kathy Griffin, two of the folks on the show today. Look at me. I'm prepared nice for school. Good to see you. Good nice to be to back you with you. Meanwhile, coming up this morning on today, two of the youngest children ever tried as adults for murder in the United States. You might remember them. The case of Alex and Derek King, the two fresh-faced Florida brothers who were only 12 and 13 when they were charged with killing their own father with a baseball bat. They were found guilty. Now they're out of prison. They'll join us for their first live interview coming up in just a little while. Also ahead, former Illinois Governor Rob Blagojevich is facing trial on corruption charges for allegedly trying to sell President Obama's vacant Senate seat. But now he says he never intended to sell it and that at least one high-ranking member of the White House staff knew the truth. He will be here to tell us about that. Also ahead, First Lady Michelle Obama has made an immediate mark on Washington and the world, especially when it comes to her fashion sense. And yes, let's be honest, those famous arms, now her longtime trainer is revealing how she gets them. But let us begin with President Obama's address to millions of students today as he steps up pressure on critics for his health care reform plan. NBC's White House correspondent Savannah Guthrie has the very latest. Savannah, good morning to you. Good morning, Meredith. Close aides are firing back at those who criticized the president's education speech before he even delivered it. And the president has his own work cut out for him this fall as health care reform enters a critical phase. At a Labor Day picnic in Cincinnati, the president trotted out the old campaign slogans. and served up some new, tougher rhetoric against opponents of health care reform. I've got a question for all those folks. What's, what are you going to do? What's your answer? What's your solution? And you know what? They don't have one. The president reaffirmed his support. <laughs> In a statement, Van Jones said he was the victim of a, quote, vicious smear campaign and said he was quitting simply so he would not distract from the president's coming fights on climate change and health care. Matt? All right, Savannah, thank you very much. Savannah Guthrie at the White House. Newt Gingrich is the former Republican Speaker of the House and the founder of the Center for Health Transformation. Newt, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Matt. Uh, let me ask you about framing, okay? People are, are, a lot of people are talking about how you frame the issue of health care reform, how you frame the debate. So when the president steps up there tomorrow night, speaks to a joint session of Congress and the American people, of course, what does he do, have to do in terms of framing that he hasn't done already? Well, the first thing he has to do is uh, undo the damage from yesterday's uh, very partisan campaign speech. Uh, Yesterday's speech was fine if you're a candidate. It's a terrible speech if you're president. And votes. Unfair to you, but in the in the few seconds I have left, Newt, this this speech he's going to make at, at a Virginia elementary school today. I mean, just as former presidents have done, or other presidents yeah. have done in the past, Republicans and Democrats, he's going to say education is important to our country. Can you see any reason that people on the right could criticize the speech of the venue? Look, I think that President Reagan did it, President George H.W. W. Bush did it. I read the speech yesterday when it was posted. I think the White House was smart to post it. If he could give a speech tomorrow night in the tone of his speech today to the students, 
this country would be much better off. It's a good speech. I recommend it to everybody if you have any doubts. Uh, I would love to have every child in America read it, think about it, and learn that they should stay in school and they should study. Pretty good endorsement. Newt Gingrich, nice to see you, Newt. Good to see you. All right. And now let's get a check of the rest of the morning's top stories. Ann Curry back at the news desk. Good morning, Ann. Hi, Ann. Missed you. Good morning Welcome to both back. of you. Hey, thanks. And to you too, Matt. Good morning, everybody. In the news this morning, today a UN-backed commission said it found what it called convincing evidence of fraud in last month's presidential election in Afghanistan and ordered a recount of some of the votes. Also today, the Taliban is claiming responsibility for a car bombing that killed at least three civilians near the entrance to a military airport in Kabul. It is the biggest attack in Kabul since the election. In Britain, three men were convicted Monday of plotting to bomb at least seven transatlantic planes with liquid explosives. The case led to the current strict limits on the amount of liquids that passengers can take on planes. Police in Milwaukee say they've solved a, series, a, a case of serial killings going back more than 20 years. They say DNA has linked one man to the murders of nine women since 1986, and the suspect is now in custody. Former Congressman Joseph Kennedy, nephew of the late Ted Kennedy, says he is not running for his uncle's seat in the U.S. Senate. Instead, he says he will continue to run a nonprofit group that provides heating oil to the poor. Rush hour headaches are expected today for commuters in San Francisco, where the Bay Bridge remains closed for at least one more day after a crack was discovered. Crews are still working to repair it. World stock markets are higher this morning. As for Wall Street, CNBC's Melissa Lee is at the New York Stock Exchange. Melissa, there is attention today on the soaring price of gold. That's absolutely right. Good morning to you, Ann. Gold surging above $1,000 an ounce uh, this morning. This is a six-month high. Gold has actually been steadily climbing over recent weeks. Last week alone, it was up by about 4%. A couple reasons behind this rise. First of all, gold is seen as a safe haven investment by investors. And second of all, the weaker U.S. dollar. Many commodities, including gold and oil, it's priced in dollars. When we see dollar weakness, we do see strength in the price of that commodity. Mm. Ann. All right. Melissa Lee, thank you so much for that perspective. And finally now, some frightening moments. Monday in Utah where a motorized parachute being used to drop prizes crashed into a crowd at a Labor Day festival. Two people in the parachute were not hurt, but six people on the ground were hurt, including three children. It is now 712. Let's go back to Meredith, Matt, and Al. The gang's all here. Yeah, they are. Welcome back, everybody. That's yeah. right, Ann. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm feeling good. That is snappy. Well, thank you very much. Very snappy. <laughs> and snazzy. Uh, snazzy and snappy. <laughs> Ooh, two for two. Let's take a look, see what's happening. And not too snappy along the eastern seaboard. We got flood watches from northeastern North Carolina into eastern Virginia. This non tropical low pressure system working its way up the coast. We're talking some areas may pick up seven inches of rain. Cape Hatteras has already gotten seven inches of rain, and it's going to continue. We're also keeping an eye on Tropical Storm Fred. It's not going to affect uh, really the Atlantic or uh, the Atlantic coast is going to be a fish storm, basically. Stay out in the Atlantic, 50 mile per hour winds moving west at 15 miles per hour. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Weather. Meredith? And now to the latest on the swine flu. A new school year is just getting underway, and we are already seeing a spike in suspected cases on college campuses across the country. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. On college campuses across the country, the kids are moving in. At Chicago's DePaul University, like elsewhere, there's an uninvited guest, the swine flu. Swine flu or not, I've always just lived at home with my family, and so it's different living in a place with this many people. You have to be a little concerned, but what can you do? They have to go to school. College websites now. For today, Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Chicago. Dr. Nancy Snyderman is NBC's chief medical editor. Dr. Nancy, good morning to you. Hello, Meredith. H1N1 vaccine not expected till, till mid-October, right. but swine flu isn't waiting. Hundreds of college kids have we just heard, maybe thousands already infected. If you think you're one of them, what should you do? And what shouldn't you do? Well, this is that gap. You're right between school starting and when the vaccine is available. So some very common sense things to do. Do not go to class if you don't feel well. You have to self-isolate yourself, quarantine yourself if you can. You heard Kevin Tibble say use hand sanitizer, wash your hands. It sounds basic, but it's the best way to avoid getting sick because it is that transmission of virus on a hand 
to your mouth but you're that already gets you sick. Ill. Let's say you're already sick. If you're already sick, well, you self-quarantine yourself for sure. Every school, as you know, has some kind of number to call for help. Schools have been gearing up all summer long for this. Figure out what that number is, whether it's to your local um, health advisory group that's been set up or whether it's to the infirmary. Call that number. Treat yourself with either ibuprofen or a Tylenol kind of medication for the fever. You say don't go to the emergency room. And, well, and make sure that you, you, you call someone to help be your support system. What not to do? Do not go to the emergency room for two reasons. One, you're going to make other people who are already vulnerable sick. And the second thing is you'll clog up the system. And the other thing, what not to do, go to class. This is the one time to play hooky. Plan ahead. Email your professors. They all know how to get med uh, um, information to you. And a lot of dorms are catering food in to students who are sick. When can you go back to class? At least one day after your fever has broken, which means fever that has not been treated. Only then can you go out in, pu in public. And in a lot of colleges, you're sharing a room with one, two, even three roommates. What do those roommates do? Well, some schools are going to have quarantine areas where if you're sick, you can go. But basically, if you are close to home, ask if your parents can come and pick you up. If not, at least warn your roommates that you're sick. They may want to bunk elsewhere. And sometimes sick kids will want to be with sick kids. This is all about self-responsibility and self-quarantine. Okay, and, and whatever you do, get that regular flu shot as well, which is available now. Get it early. Okay, yeah. Okay, Dr. Nancy Snyderman, thanks very nice much. Outfit, Meredith. You too. Yeah. We've got back vest back fever, happy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Welcome back to school. It is 717. Once again, here's Matt. All right, Meredith, thank you. And now to the latest on the case of the 18-year-long kid kidnapping ordeal of J.C. Dugard. Her case could very well change the way, way that police deal with convicted sex offenders. NBC's George Lewis has that story. George, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Matt. It's an issue that just won't go away. The local sheriff admits his office missed an opportunity to end this case three years ago, and the State Department of Corrections says it's taking a new look at the way parolees for sex crimes are monitored. Long before like J.C. Dugard was abducted, 14 years So, was Garrido tailing the camera car because he thought it was photographing his secret hideaway, a place that neither the sheriff's deputy nor his parole officer bothered to check? It's one of the many unanswered questions in this case. Matt? All right, George, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Once again, here's Meredith. Um, Matt, thank you. And now to 17-year-old tennis sensation Melanie Udan, who has become the toast of New York and the country for that matter during her remarkable run at the U.S. Open. NBC's Ron Allen has her story. Melanie Udan says she has dreamed of this moment since she started playing tennis as a little girl. Great story, good for her. It is. I mean, she's really, she's got the people talking yeah, out there, which 16. is what they need. No question. <laughs> exactly. Coming up, they were only 12 and 13 when they were arrested and later tried as adults for killing their father. Now Alex and Derek King are out of prison and speaking out live for the first time. But first, this is Today on NBC. Still ahead, how to make your arms look like Michelle Obama's, the secrets to her workout. Plus, Rob Blagojevich live in our studio after your local news and weather. Live from Studio 7E in Rockefeller Center, this is News for New York. Good morning, everyone. 7:26. It's a Tuesday morning, September 8th. I'm Darlene Rodriguez. In the news, crews on Long Island City are putting out the hot spots left over from a warehouse fire. The flames broke out this morning at 27th Street and 50th Avenue. The fire poured out of windows and doors, coming close to firefighters. Crews spent about an hour to get that fire under control, which is still smoldering right now. So far, no injuries have been reported. I'm going to check in on the morning commute right now. Here's Megan. All right. Well, let's take a look at the LIE traveling westbound just before the Midtown Tunnel related to that fire. Uh, all lanes have reopened, so that's good news. About a 10-minute wait, though, uh, heading into the toll plaza at the Midtown Tunnel. Here's the Hutch northbound at King Street. Still all lanes closed there this morning with a earlier issue from this morning. So a little busy. All right, Megan, thank you. And Chris, checking on the weather for us. Plenty of clouds, limited sunshine today. Temperatures only in the low to mid 70s. Same thing again tomorrow. Better chance for showers tomorrow night. Thursday, soggy, with temperatures only in the 60s for highs. All right, thank you guys. Coming up next, a Today exclusive two brothers behind bars for killing their father when they were only 12 and 13. They speak out. Stay tuned. It is 
7.30 now on a Tuesday morning. It's the eighth day of September 2009. So yesterday marked the unofficial end of summer. And here we are just 24 hours later. It already feels like sweater weather here in the Northeast, although we got a lot of T-shirts out there. You could see a lot of umbrellas later in the week. Al's going to tell us more about that in a little while. We just want to say hi to those people. Meanwhile, inside Studio 1A, I'm Matt Lauer alongside Meredith Vieira. And coming up in this half hour, an exclusive live interview with Derek and Alex King. Remember them? They were just 12 and 13 when they were arrested and later tried as adults for killing their own father. Now they're out of prison. They've reunited for the first time in seven years, and we'll talk to them just ahead. Also ahead just nine months ago, Rod Blagojevich was the governor of Illinois. Now he has been impeached. He's also under indictment for allegedly trying to sell President Obama's Senate seat. So where does he go from here? He's going to tell us in a live interview. Plus, how does Michelle Obama get those super fit arms? The first lady and her longtime trainer are spilling the beans. We will share their suffering. secret, show you the exercises just a little later. It's a little warm in here. But we want to begin this half hour with the Florida brothers, Derek and Alex King, who back in 2001 became two of the youngest children ever charged as adults with murder. The victim, their own father. Their motive, unclear, but some say a neighbor who was a convicted sex offender may have played a major role in that. Outside their trial, they've never talked publicly about the case until they appeared last night light on Dateline. Here's NBC's Keith Morrison. Matt. All right, Al, thank you very much. Up next, former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich speaks out in a live interview. That's right after this. Back at 745 with Rod Blagojevich, the ousted governor of Illinois who is under indictment, accused of trying to sell President Obama's former Senate seat. He says he did nothing wrong, and he's telling his side of the story in the new book, The Governor, The Truth Behind the Political Scandal That Continues to Rock the Nation. Rod Blagojevich, good morning to you. Good morning, Meredith. Since your arrest and the subsequent impeachment and the indictment, you have said repeatedly that you did do nothing wrong, that you're innocent and that eventually the facts will vindicate you. Is that why you wrote this book, essentially to prove your innocence? Well, that's certainly part of it. When you're falsely accused of things you didn't do when you've been lied about and then stripped from office after they prevented you from having the truth be told, including all of the different tape conversations that were the basis of the false accusations. So you wanted your story on the record? When you, you're an honest person and you believe that uh, you want to tell the people who hired you and trusted you that you didn't let them down. You look for the highest mountaintop that you can find and you want to shout out and say, it just ain't so. And so no one hears you if you're on top of a mountain. So the best, next best thing is to write a book and be on a television show like yours and tell people a this. A lot of people who will be picking up this book are going to do so because they want to know your response to this charge that you tried to sell the Senate seat that was being vacated by Barack Obama when he was elected president. Mm -hmm. In the book you write, this is a quote from you, there is nothing in my private conversations that would verify I was trying to sell the Senate seat. Yet in those taped conversations released by U.S. Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald right after your arrest, you're quoted as saying, I want to make money on the Senate seat and I've got this thing and it's bleeping golden and I'm just not giving it up for bleeping nothing. Now those two quotes, again, widely circulated, suggest that you were trying mm -hmm. to sell the Senate seat. Why didn't you address those quotes directly in your book? Are you saying that you, you never said that stuff? No, this is a story that is completely upside down. My accusers, and I should point out, I was arrested the morning after at 6 a.m. I had FBI agents in my bedroom at 6 a.m. The morning after, I had instructed my chief of staff, as I write in the book, to work out the tactics on what we had been working on, which was a routine political deal that would have uh, appointed a U.S. Senator in exchange for the creation of 500,000 jobs through the investment of a public yes, works you wanted bill, to appoint health the, care. The, well, let's just get the facts yep. out. You wanted to appoint the Illinois Attorney General, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa Madigan, Madigan, if her father, who's Speaker Correct. of the House in Illinois, would pass some of these bills that you had championed. He was blocking a jobs bill. He was blocking uh, expanding health care to working families and middle class families. And I wanted also a written guarantee not to raise taxes on the people. Uh, a lot of political leaders were involved in those discussions with me and were willing to help us out, including uh, the president's chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel. You say Rahm Emanuel knew about <clears throat> this deal you were trying to make. We were engaging him to, to be involved and try to put it together. The senior senator from Illinois, Dick Durbin, offered to help. And I told him to, to hold uh, uh, a, a bit because I wanted it to uh, be more ripe to try to co consummate the deal. And you but say the, Harry Reid also knew about this. Senator I, Harry Reid also knew I, about I, this. I had, conversation, I had a conversation with Senator Reid about 
uh, the, the Senate pick as well, and uh, Senator Menendez, who's the head of the Senate Campaign Congressional Committee, uh, who was willing to be helpful and try to put this political deal together. It is a peculiar coincidence that on the morning after I directed my chief of staff to work out the tactics, that I was arrested and stopped. And what is a complete lie and what is a mutilation of the truth is when the government claimed they were stopping a crime spree before it happened, when just the opposite was true. They stopped a routine political deal that would have given 500,000 people jobs, so all of that 50, would have been on the up and up health care. That would have been on the up and up, that kind of a deal. It, that's Not only is that on the up and up, but that, that was the best deal I can get for the people of Illinois. And notwithstanding, as I write in my book, my personal aversion to my choice, because it was not somebody that I, that I, that I liked and her father had been blocking initiatives that were helpful to people. So if that's true, and, and Senator Durbin knew about this, and Harry Reid knew about this, and Rahm Emanuel knew about this, they were all involved in, in some way, shape, or form, why have none of them come out? And this would vindicate you to some extent why have none of them come out and said yeah we had those conversations well let me say a couple of things that and, and you say I didn't write about F and Golden and all of that stuff that too was taken out of context that's the way that was portrayed is did a you say it is a complete lie did you uh, say I, it? I did say that but I said that in the context of uh, politics had to do with helping the people of Illinois health care and, and the Senate seat not unlike President Obama's political deal with Hillary Clinton, where he agreed to uh, uh, raise money to uh, retire her campaign debt and made her Secretary of State, she got out of the race and supported him for president. The irony here, and it's as thick as can be, is that the very accusers who said those things and took things out of context had me arrested and stopped me from creating jobs for people in my state, health care for working families, and a written guarantee not to raise taxes on people. The very people who made those accusations are the ones who went to court and are preventing those tapes from being heard in their full context. I've asked since January for every one of those tape conversations to be heard because they'll tell the full story and show I did nothing wrong. Well, those, show tapes, the truth. those tapes presumably will be heard at your trial next year. Um, the people involved in this book, so many of the politicians have, have written it off. They've been very dismissive about the book. U.S. Attorney's Office probably won't be that way. They probably will look at this book and may use what you say in it against you if they can. Are you concerned that you could have jeopardized your case by writing this book prior to trial? The simple truth is what will vindicate me. I will be completely vindicated because the things that they've said are completely not the case and completely not true. And I would ask you this question. If what I'm saying is true is true, and the tapes will bear out what I say. And again, it's the prosecution that won't allow us to have those tapes heard publicly. But if what I say is true, is true, then somebody is lying here. And it's not me. And if a governor was stolen from office by false accusations, knowingly uh, given, then something is seriously upside down. And that's what the story of this book is. All right, Rob Bogorovich, we're going to leave it at that. The book is called The Governor. Finally, the truth behind the political scandal that continues to rock the nation. A lot of people involved in this, including your wife and children, the best to them. Yeah, thank at you. What is obviously a difficult time. Thank you. And we're back right after this.